Hey, good morning, all you chess rats and mice. <laughs> How are you all? Welcome to the Backyard Professor Chess Videos. Drink more water, I'm telling you. <clears throat> Give your brain a chance to be lubricated with good stuff. I was elated last night <clears throat> to find in Arthur Yusupov, this is his booster chess. This is the first of the three in the Boost Your Chess series where he talks about the semi-open file. And this is a beautiful supplement to our pillar on the Rooks on Open Files and using your open files. Let's read what Yusupov says about this important subject. It's a great uh, extra expansion of our second pillar. The strategic theme that is linked logically to the open file is the semi-open file. Often occupying a semi-open file promises even more advantages than with an open file. And you wonder, really? Yes, here's why. And it's so, it's so simple and yet easy to understand and beautiful to put into your games, as I will illustrate with Yusupov's game here. Unlike in the case of an open file, an opposing pawn is present in a semi-open file. This pawn is reduced to being an object of attack for our major pieces. So it's a weakness in an open file that we can then make into our third pillar, a target. It's beautiful how this connects together, right? The pressure exerted against a backward pawn can either lead to the win of the pawn, or it can force your opponent into passive defense. And he bolded that sentence. So this is important. Then you can look for other objects to attack in order to overload your opponent's defensive resources. In other words, by focusing on the weakness of the backward pawn on a semi-open file, you can cause other weaknesses, which then becomes our third pillar, targets. Fantastic how this all ties in so well. So let's take a look at his game. With He is playing uh, a gentleman named Miles there in Horgan in 1994. He opens with d4, d5, queen pawn opening, queen gambit, queen gambit accepted, d takes c4, e3, c5, and now bishop will take the c4. This is typical of the queen gambit. c takes d4, and now e takes d4. So we've had a quick flurry of exchanges on ideas, and now queen comes to c7, hitting the bishop. See, they're each looking for targets while developing and improving their position. This is the theme of the three pillars without question. So the bishop bumps down to b3. Now Yusupov says something very interesting, and it's just something to keep uh, in our minds, and let's look at the difference in the position to see why he says this. He says he prefers to put his bishop here if it's attacked, in this kind of an open board, in this particular opening, rather than down here, because moving the bishop down to e2, it's not an error, but it is passive. What is the difference between passive and active? Because let's look. The bishop is behind the queen, and it truly is coming up to here, and it's coming up to here. But he says this is a bit passive, and he prefers the stronger 
the, I say stronger, more active, let's call it more active, coming down to here because it's coming directly in to the weakest pawn in the original setup, f7, and into a king side castled position if black chooses to castle king side. Even if he doesn't, he still has more direct access to targets. That's me saying that, not Yusupov. Because down here, it seems to me that there are no direct targets yet. Now, through the course of developing, yes, uh, there, we will get targets. It just seems that to go here is, well, more active, which, which means the position is better. That, that's the idea. So, so Yusupov mentioned that. I thought I would elaborate on that and actually show, let's see the difference. And there really is a difference. You can actually see the difference of bumping it down to here. So, so that's kind of fun to see. Again, the, the study in the Grandmaster games with their comments and then experimenting with the actual board position is a really great way to learn, in my opinion, and watching the Backyard Professor Chess videos, but, but that's self-certification, so I have to be careful with that one. <laughs> oh, whatever. Keep going, you moron. Okay. Black is not uh, a passive player by any means. I mean, holy cow. Bishop to g4. I mean, he's directly hitting the queen. Did, did I write that right? I can't quite believe this. Hold on just one sec. I want to make sure I wrote this down. It's easier to do it off a piece of paper than out of the book, right? <sighs> Where are we? Move, yeah, bishop to g4. I'm amazed he didn't just take that bishop. That is very interesting. I personally would have just taken it with the queen, but Yusupov did not do so. Okay, I just want to double check things because this is such a great illustration. What this does, there's a slight weakening of the king side uh, produced by this tactical trick. The idea is to get him to force up a pawn and weaken the square, right? So he did, and bishop d7, boy, I don't know. Yeah, the problem is you take, you take the bishop, and then you have a knight that comes up, and then you have to move your queen around and all, but you're a piece up. I don't see the difference between grandmasters and amateurs. I would have been materially greedy and taken the bishop. But Yusupov is, or was, the number three rated chess player in the world for a decade, so he probably knows what the heck he's doing. So let's keep going. That's just kind of interesting. Uh, he went to bishop d7, now knight e2, so that he is getting ready to castle. He does want to castle, and knight f6, and I do believe black will want to castle also. And then knight b to c3, and g6. Oh, he's going to fianchetto his bishop. That's right. He wants to fianchetto his bishop, and now bishop g5. This is this is a typical theme of getting your queen bishop up and and bumping to against that knight. In some instances, you can pin that knight to the queen, but he's already developed past that point. Yeah. So fun stuff. And then he does fianchetto. So he'll have a fianchettoed king side position. And now another uh, prominent theme which is one of our three pillars, is the idea of moving this rook onto the C file for the open file. In the queen gambit, I think both either declined or accepted. This is seen quite frequently, the rook over to that file. So good move, good move. And again, the file, it's very useful. Yes. Uh, and now queen comes back to D8. So you can see black is steadily uh, better developed 
probably a bit, I mean, I don't know if you can say uh, stronger just yet. It's, he, I, I believe he's ahead. They both castle kingside. And it just seems to me like White has a slight edge in the position at this point. But that can really change. It truly can. He castled. And now, and now, you say another pawn move. Now, once again, five years ago, uh, I wouldn't have grasped what that pawn move did. I, I would have shaken my head and said, really? pushing the pawn. I mean, number one, it's an isolated pawn, which is a good strategy to do because if that pawn gets blockaded and then attacked, then it becomes a weakness. That's what you don't want to do with an isolated pawn if you own it, right? So while he has the option of advancing that pawn, not a bad idea to do so at this point. Here's what else this move does. I, I would have criticized it because, uh, in, in my opinion, back then, back, back when I was doing my original series of Backyard Professor videos, I would have wanted to get the queen more active and strong up here in the field. Uh, I would not have understood what this is doing is it's fixing the e7 pawn. So, what he does with this pawn advance, he prevents it from becoming a weakness, and he stops the e-pawn from advancing. Therefore, it becomes a target because this is a file. A semi-open file, right? So... That's a really good move. I'm just saying, according to uh, according to Yusupov. Now, knight a6, he's going to bring his knight out. King takes a moment to go to h1. And knight c7. Now, this is, uh, Yusupov said it's an interesting move, but uh, it's probably... I mean, yeah, there's better options. He does want to put pressure against the the isolated pawn, but it's not blockaded yet. I mean, it can still move if he so chooses to move the pawn. Better is to put the rook, again, one of our pillars, onto the file. And now we have our third pillar, a target, right on the file. So he has a file, and now he has another file with a target that isn't going to go anywhere because of this guy. So his isolated pawn has actually become a strength because he put it in the right position soon enough before it was blockaded. And now all black can do is try to attack it. But do you pay attention to your isolated pawn being attacked and try to build it up and support it? Or do you go after the opponent's weaknesses? Seeing the position here, we see the knight is on the pawn and so is the queen. So really not much to worry about. If there is an exchange, he will be better for it. Yusupov's position will still improve if that pawn disappears. In the meantime, his position is going to improve because he's going to pile it on against this little guy, the backward pawn, at the end of his file. Man, that's great chess. Let's watch how this unfolds. It is really interesting. So he's taking the file, and now... Knight comes to b5, and that's a complete question mark. He, Yusupov says no, wrong. Wrong wrong way to do this. Uh, and, and so, well, he takes the knight for sure. That is worth taking. Fundamentally so, and then the bishop will take the knight. And now, uh, okay, hold it. The bishop takes the knight. Yes, and now... Knight comes to c3, hitting the bishop and also giving support to the... Again, 
nothing harmed the pawn. And now the file has opened up, so there's pressure against the weakness of this backward pawn on e7. Wow. Uh, in just a couple of quick moves with a brief exchange, Yusupov has really improved his position quite strongly. He has the active initiative position, and now Black is going to be uh, rocked back on his heels into a defensive position. That, that is... That is probably the best way to play with a semi-open file against a target. Get your, get your opponent off kilter. That's what he wants to do. Knight c3, and now bishop comes to a6. Now, it's not situated very good right there. And he says, I can actually take advantage of that. Which he does. He comes... A, a simple move. Again, he's just getting his position stronger without worrying about doing any huge, fancy attack moves. Sometimes the small moves with the extra buildup is vastly better to do. What this does, what Black is attempting to do, because he realizes that his pawn's backward, by hitting this square, the e2, he's hoping to prevent white from doubling up the rooks on this file. If white can double up the rooks on the open file and hit the target, oh man, that's... Why does this work? As you put extra pressure on a weakness with more and more of your major pieces, and black is forced to defend with his major pieces, when the pawn falls, you are already coordinated with your bishops, your knights, your rooks, and your queen. You're coordinated and your pieces are automatically already on the good squares, to cooperate to proceed into a kingside attack or to create more weaknesses. That is why piling on to one weakness makes good sense. It's a coordinating effort that actually happens automatically so that if you have to extend out into another weakness here or another weakness here, it automatically works together well, or better, I should say. That's why this works, this strategy here. Uh, so that, that's good to know. So a small increment step, a small increment step, they're both trying to get ready to strengthen their position. Yusupov with his offensive against this, and Miles with his defensive for that pawn. And it's crazy because you wouldn't think just a simple little almost close to a worthless pawn way back on its home square is worth the bother. It is entirely worth the bother because of the coordinating effect it has so that you are automatically ready to take on or else create other weaknesses that you then can attack safely. That's interesting how it, it's uh, coordinated. It, that part is coordinated every bit as much as the semi-open file is like an extended cousin of our pillar of the rooks on open files. And Yusupov definitely is a huge fan of doubling the rooks on an open file when there's a weakness to hit. Double your pleasure, double your fun, double your rooks, and go have a game this won. Yeah, that was almost poetic. Yeah, whatever. We're doing chess, not poetry. Let's go, let's go, pal. Okay, so, so, uh, this move now makes sense. I, I, technically, it makes sense anyway, right? But, but look at the effect. <sighs> Here I am ranting and raving about doubling the rooks, and what's he do? He puts the knight on e4, but re small moves, gently, slowly, building up his position. Small moves, slowly, gently, building up his position. This also helps build his position for this reason. The knight will now take the knight. You don't... 
see, if you're black, uh, he's got the file. He's got the queen connect. Look how coordinated this is. This is beautiful, man. The queen is, is coordinated with the bishop, right? Well, the bishop's already over here. The bishop is already x-raying the pawn. The rook is hitting the pawn. And now that he's bringing his knight up, man, if you're black, uh, your, your powerful defender of your king is the bishop, the rook, and the knight. Yeah? In the process of piling it on the pawn... By bringing the knight up here, you begin to also coordinate against the defenders of the king side. And if you let that knight start exchanging against the king side, then you lose the knight and the bishop. No, you see how it works. He's piling on this little guy, and he's already got the edge for attacking this big guy by getting rid of his defenders. So, black, that's almost a forced exchange. I'm going to say almost. I don't, that's not you, Sapov, that's my thinking. But really, seriously, you don't want to exchange up into here and lose two of your defenders of the king. You have to take that, in my opinion, right? But see how the coordination is already affecting his king cover. Just observe this. Yeah, it's only one piece. It's one piece. One down, two to go. That's how you're thinking is white. And it's happening, why? Because of your file use against the weakness in the file, you are weakening the king protection. Is that not fascinating to see how that works? Watch! You think I'm kidding, right? No! Watch his exchange! The rook! Not the pawn! Not the pawn! No, that completely destroys your whole point of this game. you got to know which piece to exchange, because now this isn't a weakness. You, you've just lost your file, and you've just lost your target. No, 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 no. And, and you don't, you don't want to weaken your own king side like that. No, the rook. Without question, the rook. Very nice. Notice the effect. He can now double his rooks safely, even though this bishop, he was thinking, if, if I can prevent him from bumping the rook here and doubling, then this bishop's doing something. That bishop is not well sitting there. You can see now how Yusupov knew what he was talking about, because it virtually does nothing positive uh, for black. White is steadily improving, and now look, the bishop, the knight is gone. Now the bishop has direct access to where? The weakness. At the end of what? The semi-open file, which is now going to have both rooks put in it. This is wonderful how this uh, puts it all together. Now, yeah, Black really does have to respond this way. Now he, you can see he's purely on defense, but that has to happen. A rook on e8 has to happen. No doubt. But it's not enough because Yusupov, here we go, double the rooks. Yusupov has more attacking pieces against that weak e7 pawn than black has defending pieces. Black's going to give it a terrific shot, though. Bishop f8. So, one, two, and now three. And Yusupov has one two, three, let's see what happens, very good, oh, <laughs> wow, you know, when you've got the steamroll, notice because of how he has picked a weakness to attack, really seriously, he can now 
coordinate and cooperate against the pieces that protect the king. All because of a small weakness way over here. Notice how Black's kingside position is steadily deteriorating through exchanges of defending pieces because of the weakness on the end of a doubled up rook open file. This is fabulous to see the consequences. Yeah. Various, well, queen to d6. Centralize the queen a little more. Try to, you gotta have that other rook in it. Well, you gotta, you gotta try to rearrange your bishop and put your other rook in here some way, somehow. And, of course, you, you attacked, you get rid of that defender. One of the best defenders for a kingside, uh, king castle when you, uh, push the pawn, when you fiend kettle the bishop is that bishop. To get rid of that bishop is a feather in your cap, absolutely. Now look at the effect. He got rid of one of the bishops supporting that pawn. He now, because simply of the exchange, the rook now moves away from the pawn. There is only one defender of the weakness of that pawn, and there are still two great big powerful rooks hitting that. It's a foregone conclusion, isn't it? Really seriously. Without question, now's the time. Blam. Now watch the effect, target, <laughs> here we go, third pillar. Don't forget the third pillar. And, and Bishop had the target there. There was the target he focused on, and now he succeeds in that. Now watch the effect. I, I think this is one of the most fascinating things in all of chess, is simply the effect this has of taking the weak pawn. Uh, it's astonishing. This never ceases to amaze me. Rook A comes to C8. Queen centralized to D4. Wonderful diagonal toward the king. You own the seventh rank. You own the file. Yowza. Just a yowza. The other thing this does is target both sides at one time. Yeah, he's got targets. He's looking for targets. The third pillar. Central control, file, partial or open, and now targets. The three pillars, man. It's great. It's great how that works. Rook F to D8. And now H3. Now, this is kind of interesting. His comment was, in an open board, and again, reading the board. Seriously. Understanding the position. In an open board here... Fairly, I mean, there are no pawns locked in the center, right? The pieces aren't completely occupying the center. We've seen games before where they do. In this instance, this is a fairly open board, and there's lots of lanes. I mean, there's lots of lanes and partial lanes. Make sure your king has an escape from a back rank checkmate. Take care to just take a moment, you've done your attack, you've succeeded fantastically, you're now building up to more targets and keeping an eye on the king, take a moment and make sure your king has an escape hatch. We're seeing a grandmaster do that. So, anyway, very good, very good. So, having acquired an escape hatch, Let's stop and assess this position. Yusupov at this point says white is winning. He has the better position. Let's see what is making that position better. No surprise, we're seeing all 
three pillars together here. That's the winning combination. That's why White's position is better. It's that simple. Number one, the center and center control, just directly through occupation, White has the queen and the pawn, which is influencing the center here. Post center, but it's in the center, and it has greater influence than just that single queen. Number two, the second pillar, is the rooks on the open files and the use of those files. Granted, black has a file also, but he hasn't been able to use it much to do anything really, because he has been back on his heels defending the fallen pawn. Yeah, Notice through the process, the guardians of the king, the knight, and the bishop have all been exchanged, leaving the weak king all by himself, more or less. Yes, he still has the eighth rank, so it's not weak in that sense, but there's weak squares around. And of course, we recognize there's weak squares around White's king too, no question. And then third, the third pillar, White has centralized his queen, utilizing the first pillar, and he has targets. Now don't kid yourself, that is a critically good target to hit for the end game. The material is even, however, white has one, two, three, four active pieces, well-placed pieces, that are beautifully coordinated together. Black only has one, two, three active pieces, well-coordinated pieces. Now, when I say active, Yusupov earlier in the game said the bishop here is just not well-placed. And we've seen through the course of the game that he has played very little role except for that diagonal. He, he hasn't had a chance to get it... I, I mean, man, if that bishop could be there, <laughs> you know... You see the difference here? That, that is a completely different animal. But unfortunately, it's stuck back over here. And so by acquiring the target, don't kid yourself, he's up one pawn. These pawns are even. There's no majority on that side. There's no majority on this side. There's the extra pawn. If Yusupov can get that pawn, that's the end game. That's the win. He'll have the pawn majority, right? The importance of being target conscious. The importance of the three pillars. And this is a great illustration of that. So, white is winning. That's how Yusupov says it. He says white is winning. This is why white is winning. We want to know the whys of issues like that. That is why the three pillars. Now, I simplified this. I I acknowledge that. I understand that. It's not a big deal. I haven't given you all of the different variations, and I'm not worried about it. For our purposes and point of view, the three pillars give us the essence of the kernel of how to improve our chess. And baby, this is it. Beautiful illustration. I, I know. I've elaborated enough. I apologize, and yet I don't apologize. So important to see this. Okay, so... Black recognizes that um, I, I got to get going here. I'm in trouble. So he is going to try to wrestle the initiative back from White. He has been on the defense pretty much this whole game. Well, that's over with. To continue remaining on the defense is a grave error. You now have to do something. Really, you do. And he does. He got the file. Now he's going to use it. Interesting. Yeah. Rook C1. Boom. Very nice. Well, the rook will take C1. No question. And the queen will take e7. So it's a rook exchange. 
It's okay for White that he has the Rook Exchange because he still has a file and he is up a piece. And he has a target that wins the end game. Against Yusupov, all he has to have is a pawn majority and the end game is his. Yeah, he still has this central pawn out there that's being hit, and it's still not falling. Isn't that amazing? Way early in the game, he pushed that pawn to fix that e7 pawn, and it's still here. <laughs> that's kind of cool to see, right? Queen comes to e5. Centralization. Notice the principle here, the pillar. He is still acquiring central power and control. Uh, so far, Yusupov's 8th rank is okay. Not in any great danger. That bishop supporting that pawn is doing beautiful. Notice the difference in the bishops. Yeah, they're both on the side, but this one's serving an incredible function. This one is just not... Well, like Yusupov says, not well placed there. Doggone it. And Black couldn't get him in. So, that, that's a good difference. Well, Queen B6, coming across, keeping in check, got a target. He's got targets. Now this, of course, he's not going to take into one of those, but those can be targets. But he's got a target there. The Rook is hanging. And he is acquiring the targets. And the, the Rook can really come to here quick if he's not careful. So, targets. Well, of course, Black tries to turn that around. He says, oh, you're going to pick on me? Well, then I'm going to make you a target. Decently done, yeah? Well, Yusupov comes down here to Queen F2. No doubt about that. Finally, finally... Bishop b5, the bishop can now get into this game if it's not too late. And Yusupov goes right back to the two main pillars, actually all three of them. Central power, right through the center, the open file, and hitting the target. <laughs> nice. In just one move, we see the three pillars. Again. Yeah. Yeah, we get used to seeing it that way. You notice how it helps to know which piece next to move in so many respects. And every time you do that with the idea of one of the pillars in mind, it's a stronger move than otherwise could possibly be. That's great. That means we're improving our chess. We're improving our eye to see how they do it. And that, this, that's the fun of it. Queen F6, Queen G3... Yeah, slow improvement, steady small steps when you need to. Rook comes back to d8, queen to c7, targets. Don't ever underestimate that. One of the pillars, now he's got a double hit. And don't kid yourself, that's a target too, but it is protected twice, so... But, targets, without question. Yeah. And, bishop comes to d7. And, Yusupov comes to d6, the past pawn, man. Now he can safely move that pawn. And it acquires even more power. Remarkable, isn't it? Just a little pawn. Queen h4. Black is trying hard to get something, anything. And because of the rook on the open file, boom, using the open file, target and centralization, and using the file, all in one move, you guys. <laughs> this is great to see. 
all in one move. Well, Queen G5, yeah. Target's got to move. You notice how Yusupov is keeping rocking his opponent back on his heels. Boom. Every time he moves, he is powering, empowering his position just a little bit stronger each time, and Black is reacting to it. Vital to recognize. I'm just, just helping you recognize. You're ready for another pillar. Even in this position, you might ask yourself, well, I mean, that's good that he's there, but what do I do now? Now, there are targets. Now that we're becoming better at practicing target consciousness, we do have targets. But which ones to use? Uh, that's a target. That's not what Yusupov chose to do. Yusupov chose something different. He said, what would be wrong with beginning to crack open the king side? Target. Check. King comes to F8 for this reason. Oh, I didn't write this down. I got it. Hold on just one sec. This is pretty good. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if King took it, then the rook comes. Yeah, if the king took the bishop, then the rook does this, and you're in all kinds of world of hurt. Yeah. Yeah, so you don't want to take the, you don't want to take the, the bishop. The bishop won't be taken. So he did just bump his king up. And then, bishop e6 and he resigned. Black resigned at this point. Uh, let's see, king f8, yeah. And then bishop e6 and, and he resigns. It's too, <clears throat> he's got him. He's got him where he wants him. Not necessarily at a checkmate, but he's going to be able to break in this pawn. So, what a delightful game to show us the real expanded possibilities of one of our central pillars, the rooks on open files. Rooks on semi-open files, when you can acquire a target in the files and use the files, is a logical, natural extension of our pillars. So, anyway, there's your chess video for the day. You guys have a great day. It is President's Day. Salute to all the presidents of the United States, except a few who are complete idiots. History will show that. I'm not going to name which ones. There were several. So, anyway, you guys have a marvelous day. And don't forget to drink water. It's awesome. All right, I will see you guys in the next chess video.